Funding for this program was made possible in part by and by Holtzman Oil for friendly and courteous delivery of heating oil and kerosene. We serve residential, commercial, and agricultural customers with competitive pricing, efficient delivery service, and friendly, knowledgeable staff to help when you call. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows, American Masters, Antiques Roadshow, Nature, Nova, Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today. You can never trust anybody but your guy next to you. That's why we are all brothers. I had a battalion aid station manned by myself and one medic. Because uh, in an aviation unit, hopefully, you don't have an enormous number of casualties. Much of what a flight surgeon does is psychological. Uh, make sure they don't drink too much, that they don't get down in the dumps because they got a Dear John letter. Anything that would distract them from the complicated task of flying an aircraft. Uh, primary rule of flying is that thing will kill you if you let it. We had in the first, first cavalry division, uh, every battalion had an aid station and a doctor if there were enough doctors. Then we had um, a medical battalion which set up uh, larger, more disciplined uh, aid sections. Um, and they were numbered like A, B, C and, head and headquarters. Um, if the individual needed further care, then they were from the cab air uh, by dust off. Dust off is a unit that is, it's air ambulances, that's what they do. The first cab um, in 1964, somebody came up with the bright idea that we needed an air mobile division that meant a big change in logistics. The CAV had um, 1,300 more winged vehicles and 330 less wheeled vehicles. That ambulance that I mentioned was the only one in the CAV. And the only reason we had it was that we had a uh, supply officer who was a real army supply officer. And he could steal your clothes with you standing in them if you wanted. He was good. He kept us in everything. And he'd gotten this ambulance, so uh, that's the re reason we had it. With that concept, that air mobile concept, the cab went everywhere flying. The troops had to go out for a combat mission. They were flown out by what we call slicks, uh, unarmed Huey helicopters, who would have a gunship, an armed Huey, as escorts to give them covering fire. Um, the, you just didn't roll anywhere. There weren't that many roads anyway. That was ki the idea of the air mobile concept. It allowed the division to act way beyond 
uh, where they would have been able to go with wheel or track because Vietnam was just one big bamboo jungle, three layers thick. I was in charge of the computer installation, but I was also the ranking officer in the depot at the time. I mean, a depot is a supply uh, installation that covers about, I think it was three miles by five miles. We had a little bit of everything. Uh, we couldn't find most of it. And there was all kinds of trading that went on. The trading is what messed up the supply system, but the trading also is what got supplies to people. You know, you would trade combat boots for steak and uh, uh, all sorts of things were going on. And in, in a sense, I may have presided over some of that because I could get things in and out of the gate because I was the ranking officer. But uh, uh, most of it was for a good cause. Uh, everyone was very dedicated. And after a while, you started to forget about the United States. You were there for the guys wearing green uniforms. You, th that was your family, those were your friends. You would do anything for somebody in a green uniform. A lieutenant has a lot of odd jobs. I, I had a, uh, a pretty soft job, but we, two, every two weeks or so, we had to take out what were called rat patrols. And it was after a popular television program at the time that was based in North Africa in World War II. Um, but we would have three Jeeps with 50 caliber machine guns on them. We'd go outside the perimeter, uh, ride around, um, uh, go to three or four checkpoints, and go to maybe two pl other places and radio back that everything was okay. What I learned was that or I, I uh, reasoned after a while, is we were really out there to make noise before dying. Because if a major unit was coming in to attack uh, our post, uh, we weren't going to stop it. Nobody, they weren't going to send one or two guys in. But if a major uh, NVA battalion or something was coming in, we weren't going to stop them. Because out there at night, um, you had 11 people to lead, and they were from all over. They were white, black, Latino, California, streets of New York, hills of Tennessee, and you had to go out and you had to get a job done. And uh, I, I know I was never afraid at those times. Um, be, uh, and when I came back, I was proud of it and I felt good and we had done our job. When I was afraid was when nothing was happening. When I tried to go to bed, uh, at night and everything was quiet, then who, who knows what happened, might happen in the middle of the night. Uh, so I couldn't sleep. I developed a habit of, well, three quick beers and I can go to sleep and I can still get up. And, you know, even today I, I have to have a drink before I go to bed because, you know, who knows here in central Virginia, you know, you, uh, you might have a rocket attack at any time, I guess. Funding for this program was made possible in part by and by Holtzman Oil for friendly and courteous delivery of heating oil and kerosene. We serve residential, commercial, and agricultural customers with competitive pricing, efficient delivery service, and friendly, knowledgeable staff to help when you call. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows, American Masters, Antiques Roadshow, Nature, Nova, Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today. You can never trust anybody but your guy next to you. That's why we are all brothers. I had a battalion aid station manned by myself and one medic. Because uh, in an aviation unit, hopefully, you don't have an enormous number of casualties. Much of what a flight surgeon does is psychological. Uh, 
make sure they don't drink too much, that they don't get down in the dumps because they got a Dear John letter, anything that would distract them from the complicated task of flying an aircraft. Uh, primary rule of flying is that thing will kill you if you let it. We had in the 1st first Cavalry Division, uh, every battalion had an aid station. And they didn't, you know, line up and say, our side, your side, fight it out with you. You know, they'd be farmers by day and guerrillas by night. You know, and we'd come in a ville, you know, they'd see us coming, they'd wait and torture it right then when we got there. We'd get blamed for it. You know, they made sure that the news media got the word, hey, look, you know, you guys, you know, see what they did to our village. No, we didn't do it. They did it and then blamed us. I tell my classes that I teach at Piedmont, I've done it over a dozen times. Because a person wears a black set of pajamas and has a little nifty straw hat, do not underestimate the intelligence that they conduct themselves with. Uh, the Vietnamese are very smart. They ironically know a lot of history a lot better than we do. And uh, my class is always surprised when I tell them that when Ho Chi Minh got control for a, a short period in 1945 um, and 6, that he actually used Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence as the basis of writing the Declaration of Independence for the Republic of Vietnam. So the, the little outfit intelligence people knew right away. The little outfit was no indication of their brain power. They were uh, de definitely smart, they were steeped in history, and they were fervently devoted to the cause. Because if you look at it, even subtract communism and democracy, they had been um, uh, first a protectorate by the Chinese for a thousand years. Uh, the French were there, and now we were there. So they looked at this as, oh my goodness, more foreign domination and I can't, uh, can't really logically um, argue with that. That's the facts. Uh, I think what we found is they were very crafty. Finding stuff was, went sort of like this. We'd get intelligence reports that the Central Command was on the Cambodian border where there's a big canal and it's pretty much open territory and if you sent bombers there, you could kill them. Well now, what happened would be the bombers would go there and they would be gone. They would be gone in 24 hours. And uh, why, why I've uh, remembered that point is that when we look at this story, um, I see things like Iran and Iraq where we're gonna get Osama bin Laden because he's holed up in the mountains. And I would laugh and say to my wife, oh boy, we'll see if intelligence has improved because they're gonna get there a day late and not find them there. They were that crafty. They knew they had to move because they would get spotted and people would turn them in. It wasn't like the, the, the entire populace was against the American presence. We had many operatives who um, were, were loyal to us. And um, uh, in my headquarters also later I would learn, and I was a young guy then, uh, although they called me old because I was 25, I was an old guy in the unit I served, was uh, John Paul Van, who was um, a now retired military whose name in the Vietnamese uh, lore, in the war lore, is large. He was a grandfatherly type that had served as a general from the early days and uh, as also he was the coordinator for the entire Delta region. And he would w smoke his pipe and if you went to the briefing at the command post, which I got to do because I was the lowest on the ranking thing, it's very interesting. Uh, he would say, how are you today, son, and pat your shoulder. Only later did I know uh, all the story of John Paul Van and say, wow, boy, I missed a chance to learn more from uh, someone who really knew it right from day one. So that part of it was uh, very interesting. And uh, we would also get the intelligence reports. Um, there's some things made up of this. I got to go to the briefings. And there's TS, um, top secret, SI which is the same thing that a president today would get to look at. Uh, and uh, it's, it's also a good reflection to say that the uh, situation you're in when you get that kind of access is the United States 
um, has to deal with problems everywhere in the world. To look at that black book every day, you were th in a war zone, but lots of stuff was happening. You know, those that were there, Tet is, is just a whole different world all by itself. I mean, everybody was getting hit at the same time. It was just before dusk, and a couple of the guys come in and said that they see movement out in the rice paddy, probably uh, three or four kilometers beyond us. And so we went out to look, climbed into the bunker and was looking out, climbed up on the catwalk, was looking out through the gun ports. And uh, sure enough, I mean, here was just a solid black that was just like, it was just like oozing across that rice paddy toward you. Uh, after action reports, they said there was anywhere from 90 to 100 and, uh, 140,000 men that were coming across that rice paddy. The 57th was set on a hill just at the end, almost at the very end of one of the runways on Benoit Air Base. Uh, but it was, it, it was, you know, up the highest elevation of anything around. Uh, that's where our bunker was setting, was right on there. Well, from that human wave attack, we were the point of, of that attack because they wanted the position that we had and they wanted that command bunker because with that, then they could control everything, be firing down on Benoit Air Base and just overrun the air base. Um, we called, we, we tried calling in one of our registration points uh, for them to fire on, and, and which would have been right at the beginning of this black mass that was oozing in. Um, couldn't get anyone to fire for us. You have to stop and remember that Tet hit everywhere at the same time. And so everybody wanted artillery fire to, to help support them in whatever they were doing or defend their bases or whatever. Uh, so with the Vietnamese calling in and wanting artillery you know, fire, that, that was very low on the totem pole. Uh, we did finally have one gun that said that they would give us one round uh, and that gun was 11 miles away that fired for us. Uh, by that time, this black ooze had come in Again, probably within uh, a couple of kilometers from where we were. Um, when that round, we, <laughs> I can remember them saying, on the way over, and I replied, on the way, wait. And did we wait and wait? It takes a long time for a round to go 11 miles. I mean, you don't stop and think of it until you're sitting there and you're seeing these people still coming and there was nothing, then, then, then you could hear it coming. And, and they knew something was on the way as well. And, and when it hit, hit right on the commanding officers. And, and so they had no idea what to do or, or anything. Uh, they didn't have any idea how bad we had been hit. We'd, we'd lost a tremendous amount of men. Uh, a lot of our firepower uh, we had lost because they were hitting us with recoilless rifle. Uh, with with uh, RPGs, with you name it. I mean, any, anything, mortars, anything that they could throw at us. And they didn't realize how bad we'd been hit because if they'd kept coming, they would have, they would have won. Uh, but because they lost their officers, they just stopped. Uh, after maybe another half an hour of, of, of kind of a fierce ground attack, they did drop back, in, back across the rice paddy, back into the jungle. Uh, they, they grouped up with some others. They swung around down to the other end of the airbase uh, and was going to come in there for, for another human wave attack. Uh, our command, three corps command, uh, called uh, the 57th and told us they wanted to reposition any men that we had available with any firepower down at the other end of the, the runway. Uh, so we immediately jumped in our jeeps, headed down there with what few men we had left. Uh, out of all the bunkers that were down there, we were only able to ban man maybe six of them. There were probably a good 12 or 15 bunkers. Uh, we only had enough people to man six of them. Uh, I was in B-40, and I can remember B-41 being next to us, uh, not more than maybe 25 yards away. Um, during their initial assault coming in, uh, a lot of heavy fire uh, everywhere. And, and the men that had gone down, our Vietnamese men had gone down to B-41, uh, had carried all the ammo that they could, but I mean, when you're just sitting there hammering it out, it disappears pretty fast. Uh, they actually run out of ammunition. Um, we 
we're firing at them, but to no avail, but we, we physically watch the VC come in, come into that bunker, kill our own men, put their ammunition in, in the machine guns and start firing at us with our own machine guns. Uh, that would create a breach in the perimeter so that the second human wave attack could have a, a way to get in onto Benoit Air Base. Uh, something had to be done and, and you know, you, you're just scrambling to try to think of things and I knew that we were running low on ammunition. Uh, on the radio, the radio was just horrendous. Trying to listen to anybody, trying to call anybody, trying to talk to anybody. I mean, everybody was walking over everybody else. Um, I thought I heard a chopper pilot's voice that we had worked with in the past. Um, I knew his voice very well. I knew him. I was just hoping he would remember me. I used my call sign over and over and over and over again and, you know, tried to get hold of him. And somehow he finally recognized me. Uh, he confirmed a second time that to make sure that I was who I said I was and, and, and et cetera. Um, he couldn't figure out there was just so much smoke. The, 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 the gun smoke, as well as the dust and the dirt and everything else that was flying was, was horrendous. And again, it's still night. Uh, you couldn't breathe, you couldn't see. I mean, everything you breathed in was just that gunpowder. Uh, and you really couldn't tell who was who and where was where. I mean, uh, Spooky and, and uh, uh, Puff were both up with their illuminations. Um, could not, you know, it, it still didn't do that much good. I mean, as, as far as being able to see or anything. Um, I tried telling him that there was no way that he couldn't tell which bunker the VC were in, which one we were in. And there was, I, I tried telling him there was no way I could get a canister of smoke all the way over to that other bunker because all we had was just narrow gun ports to, 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 uh, to look through and there's no way I could throw a can of smoke that distance. So I told him that, that I was gonna pop smoke on my own location and, and you know wherever the smoke is, that's where the fire is and that's where the fire is usually directed. So I had to try to you know make sure that he understood that I was putting smoke on my own location. Um, he finally agreed. He said, you know, he, he confirmed our conversation. Uh, I, I remember pulling that canister of smoke, just reaching out through that window. I, I can remember pulling the pin on that canister, uh, trying to get it out through that window, and, and I knew I was just gonna drop it just in front of it. Uh, by the time you let go of it, the handle springs off from it, and that's when the smoke starts coming out. I mean, the smoke just poured, red smoke, just poured into the inside of that bunker as much as it did on the outside. Um, I could hear the helicopter coming. He went over the top of me, he had his machine guns going, and there was dirt and debris flying everywhere. And I could just, just remember telling myself, I'm okay. And so when he asked if he had hit the right bunker, I said affirmative because I was still okay, so I knew he hadn't hit our bunker. Uh, his second pass come through, he come through with rockets on both sides and he was just firing away and, and he called in some other uh, gunships that followed him behind him. Um, literally just blew that whole cement bunker. Just there, there were not even any pieces of cement left. All it was, was just a hole in the ground by the time they'd been done. They knew that was the breach point, so then they turned their assault route coming from the air base to the outside and just started laying down a wall of fire. Between each tour, they gave me 30 days leave. Um, 
And, and so that first, between the first and second tour during that 30 days when it was home, all you heard on the news is, no, we are not in Cambodia, and no, we're not going to go into Cambodia. And a couple of weeks before that, when I got home, I'd been in Cambodia for two and a half, three weeks, you know, that type of a situation. So it was like, I knew that the news, the media was not telling the people the truth. And if they weren't telling them the truth about that, they probably weren't telling them the truth about many of the other things that were happening over there, that type of a situation. Um, I, you know, I was, again, I, I was just a, just a kid, just trying to do the, you know, what I thought was the best. And, and I don't regret anything that I did over there. And, and if I had to go again, I would. Funding for this program was made possible in part by And by Holtzman Propane is a full-service propane retailer combining competitive pricing with excellent service. Serving residential, commercial, and agricultural markets, Holtzman Propane offers 24-hour repair service, gas line and appliance installation, and automatic meter deliveries. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows. American Masters. Antiques Roadshow. Nature. Nova, Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today.